Property Podcast. I'm Simon, and I've been investing in property for over 20 years. And if you're an active landlord or planning your next property investment, this podcast is for you. If you enjoy this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could tell two other people, two other property people, about the Business of Property Podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to talk through eight things that, that I look for, um, or, or at the very least consider carefully, when I'm looking for a, a long-term property investment. So th- this is generally what I, I do. I do look for the long-term, and in my case, buy-to-let property investments. And as we're looking for, for these things to, to last a long time as sort of properties, as buildings in themselves, I think there are a number of things that we need to, to think about in order to sort of help future-proof the, the assets that we are, are purchasing in order to help them last as, as best we can currently predict anyway into the future and to, to help them hold their value into that future as well. Now, there are, there, are, uh, there are three that I'm going to start off with, which I would sort of consider the basics, really. So for, for me, this is a, a, a family home. So I'm looking for a, a property that is two to three bedrooms and that is always going to be in demand because there, there will always be families. Then pretty much any area you will, will find that there are, is a, a mix of, of different sort of households and among them will be, will be families. And in order to sort of also help maintain that, that sort of forever appeal is, is my, my number two item on the list, which is to be within walking distance of good transportation and shops. So a sort of ideal for what I would, would consider would be five to 10 minutes to, to a local shop. A, that might be a corner shop or something smaller like that. And within 30 minutes, walk to larger shopping area, sort of a, a town center kind of thing. And this would, would normally probably come with a train station or sort of good transport links of, of some description um, of a sort of major form like that, not, not just buses. Of course, if you're investing in a, in a city center, then, then these things are, are kind of given wherever you're, you're going to be investing. But most of my investments are, are not really city center investments. And, and hence, these are definitely things that I, I consider. Now, third on my list is, is a freehold property. And this isn't really because I, I feel that leasehold is obviously has a time limit on it and it might expire and you have to, to, to do something about it, whereas freehold obviously automatically is long term. But it's more about because we're holding it for the long term, we don't have to have that extra hassle of dealing with a leasehold that might change as laws change at the moment and also does need effort to renew it and, and sort of maintain it and things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go into to depths and of sort of the, the leasehold versus freehold argument on, on this episode, but but just to, to say that for me, number three in my sort of criteria of what I look for is currently freehold. So number four, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. This is sort of past the, the, the three basics I would sort of consider and more into things that, that maybe some of you might disagree with me on. But the number four is parking. Now, parking has, has always been important and I think continues to be important. Again, if you're, if you're looking at city center investments, then, then maybe, maybe you're, you're not so fast about parking. And indeed, maybe parking as a requirement would, would make finding a property very, very difficult, in fact. But I think in just slightly out of city center investments, so obviously most of the country, parking is still very important. However, it's not just having a physical space to put a car in. It's, I think, also now becoming uh, about having space where you could charge an electric car or an electric vehicle of, of some other type. So at a real stretch, this, this might include on-road charging, but the ones I'm aware of are, are still much more expensive than home charging. And you, you may still have sort of unpredictability of availability and things like that. And of course, if people are, are using home charging 
to effectively refuel for their sort of daily commute or whatever it might be, then they really need reliable, reliable access to that charging facility. So realistically, this is going to be a, a garage or a driveway or, or maybe an allocated parking space, but critically, one that you can actually get power to and then safely plug a vehicle in. So it, it's no good if you could put power sort of on a, uh, on a wall near your allocated space, but then there's a pavement between your, your wall and the allocated space where other people will want to walk because you've then got trouble sort of trailing cables across there. So I think this is one that's quite, quite difficult for an awful lot of existing UK properties. So this is, this is definitely one that, that I, I consider carefully these days. I know that some people are, are still sort of unsure about electric vehicles, but battery technology, including battery management, have got and continue to get better and better. And I really don't think this, it's a sort of concern for, for whether they can be practical vehicles. I think that's been, been proven now that they can be. There, there are still concerns around sort of whether the, the national grid will, will cope with all these extra demands being placed on it. But people are working on that. And it will take a while for existing petrol cars to phase out and things. So I, I, I hope that will be a solved problem before it becomes a problem. And in July 2024, so quite recent, about 20%, it was just under, but in, in other months it has been over. So around 20% of new car sales were EV cars, so electric, fully electric cars. And then if you include plug-in hybrids, so they may still want to be plugged in overnight, etc., then it goes up to 27% of new car sales in July. So over a quarter of new car sales sort of currently being made could really do with being plugged in. <laughs> and I, I, based on that and sort of the, the way this is going, obviously it's going to take a while, but it is going to become more and more important to more and more people. And, and hence, charging at home is going to be an important factor in choosing a home in the next few years if it isn't already for an awful lot of people. Now, number five, this is a hot water tank. You might think that's a bit strange, but but anyway, uh, hear me out. So a hot water tank or, or a space to place one anyway. Now, it's not that long ago. Well, actually, I say that maybe it's 20 years ago. That's, that is quite a while, but <laughs> it's, it's not all that long that I would actually remove hot water tanks and, and I would have the, the, the space and the, sort of the extra living space made available from taking out hot water tanks in preference to having a hot water tank. And of course, you would use a, a sort of on-demand water heating from a, from a combi boiler type setup to actually provide the hot water. And, and this seemed, seemed like a great idea. However, fast forward a decade or two, and, and it now seems that the, the future of heating in our homes uh, is likely to be heat pumps. And at least for the moment, there are generally two requirements when retrofitting a heat pump into a property. Uh, and one of those is having a hot water tank because heat pumps aren't able to, to respond quite as dynamically as a, a gas boiler would. And hence, you really need to have been able to, to preheat that water and store it in a hot water tank ready for, for future use when you actually need it. And I said there were two. So the, the second one of these requirements is number six on my list. And this is space to actually install the external heat pump unit. Now, the, these are relatively large and there are rules around how close you can put them to the, the sort of edges of your property or rather to your neighbors anyway. So this is something you, you need to think about. And if you've got a, a sort of fairly small terrace house with, uh, I don't know, a couple of windows, maybe a couple of windows and a door when you're looking at front or back or what have you, then, then that might actually take up sort of all of the space you've got on the fascia of your, your property. Even sort of when you go up a floor, if you had a, a wall mounted uh, heat pump, it it could still be that you've you've got too many windows in, in the property and, and there just isn't space for this unit. So that I think is definitely something that, that I consider at the moment. And 
it may be that in the, the longer term, this becomes less of a problem as technology improves. But for the next five to 10 years, I think it is very likely that this is going to be an issue, especially as gas boilers are being phased out over that time, probably. And and you, you, you will have failures of these things, especially if you haven't replaced it recently. And hence, you will have to find a, a solution there and, and somewhere to put a heat pump, probably. Number seven on my list is a south facing roof. And this is definitely one that it would be more in the consider category than actually definitely really need. But this is in order to make it most likely to work well for solar panels. And you could use an east facing roof and a west facing roof and sort of get, get the sun in, in the two halves of the day, if you like, rather than trying to catch the bulk of it as it comes around to the south. That, so there are options here. And it might be that maybe you could just put solar panels on, on one side, which is sort of close to to one of these directions, and it would be sufficient to, to be worthwhile as a, a sort of improvement to the property. However, there is also the possibility that the maybe solar panels aren't really needed. And, and this is probably well, the, the sort of decision around this. It could be to help improve finances and costs for energy, but it could also be a part of improving your EPC rating potentially. And this is number eight on my list. And that's the EPC rating. So at the moment, I would only consider purchasing a rental property that is currently a C and has reasonable options available for it to reach a level B in the EPC. There is one exception to this, and this is if I was looking at purchasing a property where I'm actually doing a fairly extensive refurbishment. And in that case, it could obviously be less than a C currently in the CPC rating, because built into that refurbishment, I would, would have plans in order to actually, at that point, probably just jump it straight to an EPC B. And if that wasn't possible, then I think that really wouldn't be a sensible investment for refurbishment. So I'd either be looking at already a C, so it's going to, going to tick all the boxes for the sort of foreseeable future for the next decade or so, probably. And scope to get to a B without too much trouble. Or I'd be looking at a, a refurbishment and already wanting to push that property up to an EPC B in order to make sure that it's got that, that longevity in its its future future life. And when thinking about the EPC rating, it's it's not just about energy efficiency and the 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 bills that the tenants are going to have to pay, although that is obviously part of it. I think that's certainly going to help with with selling the property as a rental property for your prospective tenants. But it is also about ensuring that the property has a good good comfort for for the people living in it. So that it, it can be a a comfortable home and people can enjoy that home. And EPC I think is is probably a pretty bad proxy for that, but it's currently about the best we've got really on a sort of mass market scale, at least. So that was my list of, of eight things that I, I look for and I would recommend that others look for when considering future-proofing long-term property investments. So a quick recap. One was a family home, two to three bedrooms. Two is walking distance to shops and major transportation. Number three is freehold. Four is parking, especially with the ability to charge an electric vehicle at that parking point. Five, space for a hot water tank or an actual hot water tank linked, of course, to number six, which is having space to actually install an external heat pump or the external element of a heat pump. Seven is a south facing roof for solar panels, or at least considering how solar could factor in to helping the property and its energy demands. Which of course also ties into number eight, which is an EPC rating of at least C and at least having good options to get to a B or with a refurbishment plan to land it at an EPC B. So it's a slightly shorter episode today 
uh, because it is it is summer, it is holiday season, and I thought it might be nice just to have a, a slightly slightly shorter episode for everyone. If you have enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could tell a couple of other property people about it. Tell them to have a look for the Business of Property podcast in their, their podcast player of choice. And I will look forward to speaking to you again next time. Yeah.